So, hello everybody. Hi. Hi, can you hear me? Well, great, yeah. Sure can, yeah. yeah. Somehow my headphones don't work this soon, so I'll, I'll put them off. Um, okay, um, welcome. Today is um, a third or a fourth session already. Um, and I'm really glad to see uh, so many uh, familiar faces uh, in, the, in the list. And today I would like to um, spend a little time to look at the uh, X Sharp RDD system. Um, not everything is going to be really easy um, because RDDs are not easy, but I try to keep it um, as simple as possible. If you think, uh, if you're lost and you think, you have a question that's worthwhile I'm asking, please interrupt me because otherwise I'll just continue. People who know me says he can continue until everybody falls asleep. So if you have a question, don't hesitate and ask. I will uh, share uh, my PowerPoint screen and my Visual Studio uh, alternative thing. So um, I have a bit of PowerPoint to, to, to explain some of the principles, but most of the time we'll spend in source code. Okay, you should be see my presentation now. Good. Okay, what do I want to look at today? I want to give you a brief overview of the RDD architecture in X Sharp, the types, classes, and interfaces that are there um, that we use, uh, how to add event handlers. Um, sometimes it's useful to uh, add some kind of monitoring to your application, monitoring, and event handlers can. Uh, We've added them and you can use that for that. I also want to show you how you can, uh, event handlers are basically global, are working over all uh, areas, but you can also um, intercept an individual area or cursor by using what we call a wrapper and then uh, monitor what it's doing or actually cha also change what it's doing. And finally, um, I want to give you a small demo of your own RDD, and what I will show is a, a poor man's encryption of DBS. So you can, well, I use the, the most e simple encryption algorithm that there is, but I'll show you, and of course you can extend that if you want. Good. The RDD architecture. This is a slide with a lot of text. I know it's not good. Most presenters are told not to do, do that next text, but just this quick overview, and then I'll go to source code and show you what it is. We have um, a couple of different ways of working with RDDs in X Sharp. The first one is historic, but also uh, DBase and Foxtro have is using RDD commands, commands such as use and go top, I skip, etc. The second layer is DB functions. Um, these functions were there already in uh, Clipper, and uh, I also know that they exist in X++. And these are untyped functions, so their parameters are untyped and optional. And uh, when you do something wrong, they may throw exceptions. Then there's the third group, is to what we call the VODB functions. And as the name already implies, these were introduced by visual objects. And these are usually uh, a counterpart of the DB functions, but they have typed parameters. They do not throw exceptions, they just return a failure or success with a return value. And internally in X Sharp, they call methods in a class where the actual work is done. And finally, the fourth layer is what people from visual objects know, is the DB server class is an object oriented layer on top of the uh, VODB functions. Now, enough PowerPoint, let's uh, look at some code. Okay, I have to switch screen. Yeah. Um, if you see Mr. Data in the participant list, that is my uh, monitor. So I see what you see, and I can see that the font is big enough. Okay, I have a um, project here, and in my Visual Studio solution from today, I have five different projects. Um, and to start with, I would like to say that all projects are compiled in the Visual Objects dialect. So um, I'm not using Fox Pro specific things here. This is visual objects. That also means, well, you'll see it in the code. My first example is, is called command-based, and it will use 
commands to open a customer file. The particular customer file is included here in Visual Studio. And I have set the properties to always copy it to the output folder, as you can see here. So um, it says copy always. So every time I build this um, app, come on, go back. Um, if a brand new copy of this file is copied into the output folder. I have something wrong here. I've lost my mouse. Yeah, doesn't matter. The mouse is not that important. Okay, so we see use customer, which will be available in the output folder. Go top, do one not enter file. This is familiar. Most of us have known this. Um, what we also have here is uh, we've added this for Fox Pro, but it also works in other dialects. It's a scan and scan routine, which basically I think was designed in those days by the people from DBase 4. Let's see what it does. Let's run this. So I'm compiling it. Um, the first time takes a bit longer, as usual. And we see the list of customers in the do while loop. And after that, in the code, I had a scan and scan with a for condition for state is California. And this, this also works. Um, one of the things you should realize is that these commands are not really part of the language. Um, the way it works um, is that we have added, well, let's say, let, in, in the documentation, we make a distinction between commands and statements. Statements are really part of the language and are compiled by the compiler itself. So the compiler knows how to do a while loop, for example. Uh, commands are actually um, defined in a header file, now I'm missing my mouse. And I've opened a link to this header file. And as you can see, this header file contains hash command. These are user-defined commands. And these user-defined commands are uh, mapped into a DB use area, followed by optional DB set index, etc. Um, you could say that this is some kind of uh, prehistoric regular expressions, basically. Um, this was used uh, by Clipper, by XBase++, uh, by Harbor, and we decided to also put this kind of functionality, so the preprocessor and the commands, into our compiler. Um, see where am I? What the compiler does is actually pre-compile this into but, um, it's a bit strange. Um, last week we did a session about the RDD system and um, I had to reset my machine halfway and half of the re or more than half of the recording got lost. So I'll do it again. And I considered uh, doing it on my own, but I said, well, I can make it public. Why not? Um, it gives other people who didn't attend last week the chance to attend and it gives us a chance to ask questions. Uh, I will not repeat everything that I did last week. Uh, so I will uh, skip into the session uh, to do Point where we were, so we can probably go a little bit more into depth. And um, well, let's see. Um, go back to the presentation. Okay, last week um, we looked at the RDD system, and uh, the, the moment where um, Windows asks some questions, let me just quickly answer that. Go into presentation mode, kill the notifications. Uh, where we were last week was uh, looking at commands, functions, etc. So that's where I'll jump into my presentation. Uh, in the YouTube video that we'll create, we'll uh, just uh, cut the uh, this presentation and just stick it 
behind the other one. And uh, well, some things have changed. As you can see, I'm wearing a different shirt now. I had a head, I went to the hairdresser, and I'm wearing other glasses. But apart from that, uh, things should be the same. Okay, let's go to where we were last week in the presentation. Go to a new screen. Okay, you should be able to see my Visual Studio. Let's drag uh, this away. Come on. Good. Okay, last week um, I showed uh, commands and the commands get translated into um, by the preprocessor into functions. And these functions were introduced in Clipper as replacement for the command. And the difference between uh, Clipper and uh, I would say DBase and, and also Fox Pro is that um, those languages kept uh, the command interface as the default interface to access uh, data, where um, Clipper and its many successors like um, Harbor, uh, X Plus, and of course Visual Objects and X Sharp uh, went into the direction of function based access. The, we have different kinds of functions. We have untyped functions like the deep use area. We have type functions like VODB use area, which were introduced in visual objects. And the biggest difference between those two is that uh, DB family of functions, uh, all parameters are untyped, and many of them are optional. As you can see, uh, this particular call to DB use area skips uh, the first two parameters, where if you compare the same call with VODB use area, the first parameters are indeed filled in. Uh, the parameter is whether it's a new area, which RDD to use. Uh, and after customer, you see that there's also a few other parameters like the alias for the new work area and whether it should be open to read write and whether it should, open, should be shared or not. So VODB use area and the whole family of VODB functions is all typed. Uh, but what you can do, one of the questions last week was, can you freely mix them? Yes, you can freely mix them because in the end, all of these functions uh, use the same underlying RDD infrastructure. So they're all, they are just different access points into the same RDD system. The biggest difference I would say apart from the typing is that the VODB family of functions um, doesn't throw exceptions, at least when there's no real problem, but for example, when you try to do a go top in a work area that's not open, it will not throw an exception, but it will just return false. And uh, where the DB functions are meant to throw exceptions when that happens. Now, I'm not. Uh, I know that many people on board now are um, uh, VO developers, so I'm not going into details about a little bit about these. And also, I want to briefly skip now the DB server class, but um, DB server is basically an object oriented layer on top of the VODB functions. And inside X Sharp, we have added both the, this, the, the DB server layer, of course, and we have also added the VODB and DB functions. But in the end, the old, uh, all these layers map into the same architecture. Now let's go back to the PowerPoint. Okay, so all these layers, the commands, the DB functions, and the VODB functions, and the server class uh, map into the RDD system, and they call methods into two classes. And there's a the important, most important one is the core DB class, which the name also indicates is a class inside X Sharp Core. And the core DB class basically has static methods for every uh, thing you want to do in the RDD. So it has methods to open and close files, it has methods to um, uh, get a value, write a value, etc. The difference between CoreDB and VODB is that CoreDB is in the core assembly and doesn't know about uh, usual type. So everything in CoreDB is strongly typed. And 
those methods that do not return a fixed type, like for example, get value that reads a value from a field, will return objects where the VODB class is inside X sharp core RT and it does know about our own types and it returns usuals or accepts usual parameters. So that, that's the biggest difference. Um, we looked at it and said, okay, how do we do it? Well, the idea is that um, we didn't want to put everything in the RT assembly because that would mean that if someone wants to use our RDDs outside of uh, X sharp, they would have to go through uh, the usual layer. Said, okay, well, what we'll do is we'll put it in X sharp core, we'll make it use objects, and only those methods that are uh, polymorphic, so that use usuals, those are in VODB. And you will see if you look at those classes, and I probably can open them in Visual Studio so you can get an idea, is that these classes have uh, some methods the set just with the same names, but except that VODB has different parameter type. Um, let me quickly show you that. I have to switch again. Right now in my editor, I have open uh, CoreDB. And as you can see, we have static methods for beginner file, for clear filter, you name it. Some of the things you may have seen and wonder what, what this is doing, a um, little sidestep, but what we have done here is try to um, minimize duplicate code. So like I said before, uh, the RDD system doesn't throw exceptions, but of course exceptions may happen. And what we have done is we have created a method called do, it's just a name, and the do method takes a lambda expression this is the syntax for lambda expressions. And this particular lambda expression is actually the complete implementation of what buff refresh must do. And the do method, we can quickly look at, is responsible for setting up a try catch block. So it sets up a try catch, it calls the action, which is the lambda expression that's sent in. And uh, when an exception happens, it will call fail and fail should also be here, yeah. Fail actually uh, sets the last RDD error in the runtime state and uh, sets a, uh, gets the prop name basically. Um, I'm doing a trick here to hide the prop name of the uh, do method and then calls an operation failed. Uh, and this particular race operation failed is something that we'll see, well, we could see later in the event handy because this will trigger an event that the operation has failed. So I was in uh, DB buff refresh. Uh, so buff refresh actually calls do and says what you have to do is get the current work area, uh, call a method uh, with the name rec info and return true. And this is passed to the core DB do, which takes this complete lambda expression and will just return true or any other return value that's in there. Um, so this is basically a, a way to standardize error handling uh, by using uh, lambda expressions. And as you can see, uh, we've used it extensively. All the methods in CoreDB have this lambda expression syntax. There are one or two exceptions, and that is because uh, inside the lambda expression, we cannot parameter, have parameters by reference. For example, the uh, let's see which one. The info method. There's an info method overload that has as object, which uses the same technique. But you see the info method that has an overload ref object actually doesn't use this lambda expression because that's not allowed with lambda expressions. Um, there may have been a trick to do it otherwise, but uh, we thought it was just easier to implement this directly. Okay, so this is the core DB, and I mentioned the VODB, which is in the RT assembly. As you can see, X sharp VODB inherits from core DB. And um, what's different here is, for example, this blob info now has a ref usual, where the blob info in 
the uh, Accordi B has a ref object. So that's actually the only difference. And that's what you can see here is that it forwards the method call to Accordi B blob info and then uh, refs ORED, which is the object that is declared here locally. And after return, it stores ORED into this uh, pointer red and then returns it. The name here is actually copied from uh, a name we had in the uh, Vulkan official object. So uh, I probably wouldn't have chosen pointer red um, if I wrote it completely from scratch, but this is what we used it and it was easier for documentation purposes to do it. As you can see, we have only a handful of methods in VODB, and all of these methods either have a usual parameter or a usual return value. Info as usual, order info with a ref usual in here. So that's the only reason why we have this VODB class to return uh, or a usual variables by, by reference or uh, I accept usual parameters. Is this clear so far? I can't read that. Let's see. There must be a chat window. If you have questions, just switch on your mic. It should work now. I have my audio on, so I should also hear your questions. I'll try to improve from last week. Okay, so let's go back a bit. So we have VODB inside X sharp RT, which it has from CoreDB. What some people did, uh, noticed when they read the source of the RDB system and the source of the runtime is that we are calling everything on VODB. So even if the static method is declared in CoreDB, I'm still calling it from VODB. Um, but that's allowed. Uh, if you have a subclass, uh, uh, which VODB is, you can call the methods uh, on the subclass, and if it's not implemented on the subclass, you can still, you will end up calling the method from the parent class. But I've done it in this way because um, then when writing the methods inside the runtime, I don't have to think about which layer is implemented in which class. I just call everything on VODB. The compiler is smart enough to know that it doesn't exist in VODB and redirects the method call to CoreDB. Okay. Good. Um, yeah, some people, uh, last week, I've, I've used the phrase RDD a lot. Some people asked what RDD means. Yeah, and I should have started with that. RDD is, uh, comes from Clipper, and it stands for Replaceable Database Driver. The idea is that you can replace the driver with which you access DBF files. Um, in Clipper, it was, an, it was not easy to, to combine more than one RDD in the application. Uh, later in visual objects and also in the other languages like um, Harbor and English++, um, you could mix RDD. So you could have more than one RDD at the same time. Okay, the architecture about, of our RDD system. Um, the important thing is that each work area or cursor um, is handled by an object. And this object is of a type that implements IRDD. IRDD is the list of things that an RDD must implement. And these things, uh, I think in the next slide we'll go into detail, but these things are things like uh, go top method, uh, a found property, and enter file property. You, know, you understand what you need if you work with DBS. The collection of areas or cursors in FoxPro that's called data session, we have a work areas class. This work areas class has a list of unique names and numbers and objects are text to these names and numbers. And usually there's one area which is the current work area. Um, there are different types of RDD classes and um, if, if you open an area through an RDD, you usually specify an RDD name such as DBF CDX. We have a um, a table inside the runtime that says DBF CDX is implemented in the uh, X sharp RDD assembly, and the type name is, um, if I remember correctly, X sharp dot RDD DBF CDX. So this is the way that the uh, runtime knows about where RDDs are implemented. If you write your own custom RDD, which we'll see later during the session, then you can uh, add your own name. Uh, 
to this table so you can uh, uh, refer to your IDD by name. If you open an area with an IDD, then what the runtime will do is dynamically load the assembly and then instantiate an object from that type. It's dynamically created and added to the collection of areas. This also means that um, you have to be able to find the assembly that has the RDD. There's no hard link between uh, the runtime, so I mean X sharp core and X sharp RT, and the RDD system itself. It dynamically loads it. So you have to make sure that the X sharp RDD assembly, or in general, the assembly that implements your RDD is available to the runtime when you deploy your app. In general, it's enough to just copy it to the same folder where your XC is running. The RDD is the most important type. I already mentioned that, and it has several methods. I'm not going to look at all these methods right now, but we can look at them later if you guys want that. The work area class is in X sharp core, and it implements a basic set of methods. It's so what you can read, it doesn't open files, but for example, it assumes when a file is open that uh, how to skip or how to uh, implement the, the backbone of DBEVEL. So uh, go top and then uh, go to a specific record or filter records based on a for condition or uh, end a loop based on a while condition. These kind of implementations are a work area. Most of the RDDs that we've built in inherit from work area. It's up to you to decide if you do your own RDD, whether you actually do one from scratch and simply uh, have an object that implements IRDD or a subclass work area. Uh, we have used the, the work area as a subclass, but it's not necessary. And we have some helper classes, and most of these helper classes are just um, so we can pass one parameter around instead of uh, two or three or four parameters at the same time. For example, DB filter info has the filter string and the filter code block. Uh, DB order info has an index name, the tag name, the expression, the unique flag, uh, those kind of things. I'm not going to look at all of these. These are most of these are in the help file, and, and you can see them in the source. And those of you who coded with RDDs will uh, recognize that the parameters, for example, or the, the, the properties of DB filter info match the properties of the set filter method. Okay, what is the relation between work areas for this collection and RDDs? Well, like uh, before I said, work areas is like a group of open uh, RDDs, and each RDD each, uh, is linked to a number and a name in the work area table, and each RDD uh, I should say each, each open area is represented by an object. So we have, uh, when you open two files, you will have two objects in this table of work areas. Uh, in the current um, 2.4 version, um, work areas contains an array of objects. In the meantime, I've changed that uh, because when looking at that during one of the previous sessions, I thought it was a bit, uh, bit stupid to have 4,000 elements in an array when most of you are not using more than 10 or 15 at the same time. It's a waste of memory. So we've changed it now into a, uh, a dictionary of the area number and the object, which gives you a little bit less memory usage. What's important to realize is that each thread has its own collection of work areas, which also um, introduced a problem for us, because uh, if you open a file let's say with a DPF file with the DB server class, and then uh, do not close it, but you have code in the destructor of the DB server class, then the destructor runs in a different thread. It runs in the garbage collected thread. And it didn't see the work areas collection. So we had to um, add some uh, tricks so the destructor can still um, find the area where the RDD was opened. But that was... Uh, not too difficult, but it was uh, something we hadn't expected or didn't think about. And in the, our predecessor, Falcon, that was not an issue because it didn't have work areas per thread. But since we introduced that, we also had to solve the problem 
that was a result of that. Okay, this is a uh, overview of the most important classes. As you can see, we have the work area on the bottom. On the left side, we see the uh, DBF family, where uh, at the moment we have implemented uh, NTX on top of DBT, and we have CDX on top of FPT, and on top of CDX, we have two implementations of the Fox Pro version of the uh, CDX system, and the difference between the Fox Pro and the DBF CDX is that it supports more field types. Now, there is uh, no problem at all opening the Fox Pro file with DPF CDX, um, but you cannot create a Fox Pro compatible file with DPF CDX because it will not allow uh, extended Fox Pro types. But the way if we've coded it, if you would open a Fox Pro file with DPF CDX, it will recognize auto increment fields or uh, memos of uh, where the uh, memo pointer is stored uh, binary instead of in, in ASCII format, then it recognizes. But the other way around, you want to create a Fox Pro file, you need the DBF VFP. In the middle, you see ADS and its family. I'm not listing them all here because it's a huge list. And on the right hand side, we see the uh, text RDD family where we have uh, SDF, the LIM, and the subclasses of the LIM that. Uh, support uh, semicolon and tap the limited files. ADS itself is, like I said, a whole list of classes. We've uh, copied the class structure that uh, Advantage or Sybase or I think SAP now uh, created for Vulkan and we are using the same type names that they did in for Vulkan. So you should be able to compile your Vulkan code with little or no changes. This advantage family uh, depends on the advantage, the LLs such as A32 or A64. Uh, we didn't recode all of that. What we did is we coded a layer on top of ACE, and uh, just like the Vulcan RDD is also coded on top of ACE. Good. Um, One of the new things we've added that doesn't exist in visual objects or doesn't exist in Vulkan, uh, something similar exists in uh, Interactions Plus, is uh, that gives you the opportunity to add event handlers to the RDD system. So it gives you the opportunity to notify or get notifications when something happens in the RDD system. And we've chosen two methods. And I will show them both in an example. What's important, and there was a question about it last week, is to do as little as possible in this event handlers because um, it could slow down uh, your application. Let's just go to the source because that's much more interesting. Switch the screen. Okay, I'm back in Visual Studio. So a startup app. And let's see, I have, like I said before, we have two methods of uh, adding notifications. One is a delegate, and the other is by registering a client object. I'm showing both in this example. The first one is the delegate, where what you see is we have created a function. This could also be a static method, by the way, or a method. This function gets two parameters. One is a parameter of type IRDD, and the other is a parameter of type DB Notify Event Arcs. And DB Notify Event Arcs is a specific type we created for this event. And as you can see, it has a data property and a type property. The type is of DB Notification type, which is an enumerator. Uh, enumerate a type in the runtime which has values like uh, record change, uh, before field change, after field change. So this tells you what kind of event happens in the RDD system that triggered this particular notification. Now in this, in this example, I have a normal standard VO app and first I'm going to show you this particular notification uh, delegate. So I'm going to register uh, an event handler. This is the way .NET 
you, you rank the event handles by saying plus equals and notify RDD operations as the function inside this event handler PRG. Let's set a breakpoint so we can see what happens. Okay, let's run it. Ah, before I forget something. Okay. Um, I'm on a development machine and it's really important that I make sure that I have the right uh, stuff in my global assembly cache. So I'm going to add the um, two four release now to my assembly cache, otherwise the application will not run. And let's go back. As you can see, this is the normal VO MDI app. Call it file open here. And I'm opening customer. And now you see that after the file was opened, I end up in this notify RDD operation function. I'm getting a sender, which is the RDD that was sent in. And I'm getting as data and an event. Uh, arcs has a type and it says this was a file open event so this gives me more than enough information to, to keep track of what's happening we get complete rdd as this sender object so we can read the current record number we can can read uh enter file flag you name it what i'm re re showing here is i'm reading the alias which is as you can see customer its area which is 4096 and then the type is file open, the data is the file name, and then I'm displaying the beginner file and enter file. I'm using dip out here, which is a uh, VO compatible function, which sends stuff to the debug terminal. So let's open that one. And I hope that this is going to, as you can see, this is not showing what I wanted. Uh... Yeah, I've been here before. I have to start it before I start my app. That's a no brainer. And now on the screen, you can actually see that it has a file open event. And beginner file is false, enter file is false. And when I skip, you can actually see now on the bottom that we have a before move and an after move. So this gives us the chance to yeah, do whatever we want. So at the customer where we created this for needed this to keep track of where things were updated. And this is really a convenient way of monitoring things. Let's say I go to the bottom of the file. You can see we get a before move, go bottom, after move. And now I skip. You can actually see uh, before move skip, enter file is false. After move skip, enter file is true. And then uh, the UI here, the, the GUI classes, actually, when you detect a uh, enter file, issue will go bottom. And after that, false is again the value for enter file. So this shows you what's happening. And, and for example, if you do a browser, Let's clear this one. You can actually see that um, the browser itself triggers, or well, not anymore, but it, it started with triggering a lot of events. Um, the buttons do still do skips, but if you do a click, you will actually see that it doesn't go to. So you can actually monitor what's happening. Let's take an example of updating something. Clear this again. I'm going to change Robert to Todd. And you can see we have a before field update first name and an after field update first name. So uh, this actually, we get all the events we need. And if you close the window, you can see that we get a clear relation, which we call in the RDD system a bug operation and then a file close. So this particular function allows you to uh, monitor events. Like I said, 
be smart, don't do too much because if you do too much or if you start playing with the sender object, the IDD, your application may get confused. I'll show you a different implementation. Don't take too much time, but this is a bit different. This is now an object that implements IDB notify. This could also be a shell object. If you could also add a method to your shell object to do this. And now, not the delegate is called, but this particular method is called. And as you can see, the prototype of the method is the same as the prototype of the function here. And what I, why, why I wrote this is that I want to show you, uh, for example, in this case, that I'm using the VO log file class to actually log the operations to disk and not to the debug terminal. And what I also wanted to show you is that you can uh, respond to different event types. So the field update, for example, what is showing in the log file now is the old value and the new value. Let's run the app. <coughs> um, now, of course, it would be nice to go to the folder where the code is. So. And the application is called Event Handler. This is the log from last week, so I'll throw it away. As you can see, the field update gets here, gets the before and after field update, and in the log file. Where is it? This happened last week too. Somehow, maybe the log file hasn't been closed yet. Chris, do you have an exp explanation why the log file wouldn't be there? No? Sorry, no. I didn't get it. Try it again. Maybe because I ran into the debugger. Could be that by because I'm in a debugger, the location of the file is different. So it, it picks a different folder. Can't imagine that. Now it does have an event handler, and you can see file open before move. We see old value Robert, new value top. You can actually monitor what's going on. Okay, so what I the idea of this particular topic was to show you that we've added event handling and it works. Any questions about this? Well, let me emphasize, don't do too much. Don't, don't go playing with the uh, RDD itself. You could uh, destroy the behavior by responding and doing a go top from within your event handler. That could uh, end up uh, coming back in the event then, and you could get a recursive code with all the potential problems in there. I'm not going to show you, but you can imagine what happens if you build that kind of recursion in there. Let's go back. Good. Now, what if you're not interested in all areas? But let's say um, there's one file where you know that particular uh, uh, behavior you want to change. And what we created in runtime is a special class called wrapper RDD. And this wrapper RDD class allows you to take an RDD object and replace it in the work areas collection with a new object of this wrapper RDD class, which internally uh, has the old RDD and forwards all methods to the old RDD. The idea is that you can then selectively uh, intercept one or two methods. It works for all RDD types. Uh, it's relatively easy because you don't have to uh, implement a complete RDD. And you can just look at one or two methods and you can change the behavior of one or two methods. You do not have, at least not the proper way, access to protected or private fields or properties, but at least it gives you a quick entry. It's probably easier to show you than to explain. And let's go to the code.
This is a class that inherits from wrapper RDD. So I call it my RDD, you could call it any name you want. And what it does, well, it has to implement to become a constructor that takes an RDD object. And what it does, it tries to find the field with the name first name. And in the get value when reading, it says whenever the first name is taught, uh, return Robert, because I want to show something. And what it also does, it reverses the operation of go top. It returns go bottom for go top and the other way around and skip, uh, reverses the number of records to skip and end of file and begin of file are uh, reversed. So I'm not doing anything else. So, and this should work with any RDD. So I could use uh, NTX, CDX advantage, all these, uh, RDDs have a go top and have a go bottom method. And this particular class now takes the uh, existing RDD, reverses the directions of the navigational uh, methods, and suppresses returning thought. And let's see, we have the code here. I'll just run it. Uh, I think you guys can understand uh, what happened. So I'm using the uh, Customer DBF that I copied from Visual Objects. I do a go top, but you can, as you can see, after the go top, the first row it shows is Brian Mahoney, so it actually did a go bottom. And then skips to the first one, which is Todd Evans, and it does display Todd, but it displays Robert. And to show you that in code, in the debugger, Now, this is probably an important line that I need to emphasize. Um, if you use the wrapper RDD, you have to tell it which RDD object to replace. Now, what I'm doing here is I'm calling a new, uh, or I call it dbinfo, which is an existing function also in VO or Vulkan, but I'm passing it a new identifier, dbi RDD object, and this returns the current area object, which is of type RDD. I'm casting it therefore to IRDD because uh, my RDD actually wants the IRD. Uh, the, uh, the cast in the second line of code is, of, is not necessary because it's already of the right type, but I'm just habits. And in here, you can see that ORDD is of type DBF NTX and is an RDD that opens the customer work area. And in here, you see now all the uh, properties and fields of the um, DBF class, basically, DBF NTX class. And when I do the super go RDD, you actually see now that self, which is my RDD, is a wrapped version of DBF NTX customer. Inside this, you can see the normal properties. These are all tough. And you can actually see the RDD object, which is the original one. So this is the object that actually gets called for all methods that we do not change. Now let's set a breakpoint here. In the call and code, we did a go top, and the go top now executes a go bottom. And let's look here. And when I read Todd, we must be on the last row. Yeah, we are. Um, I replace the result. So by using this wrapper RDD, you can uh, use basically any RDD and either monitor it because we could have built in a logging here as well or uh, change its behavior. Now, I'm not sure if this is useful to you guys, the customer that I wrote this for, uh, what it is, and for them it was very useful. Uh, I, I know that they were monitoring um, the change in a specific field and they had no idea where in the code because they were having a uh, uh, a lot of data-driven code where this particular field was updated and by subclassing the area, um, setting a breakpoint or, lo or adding logging on the particular uh, get value and put value, they were quickly able to detect where this particular field was updated and could then fix potential problems in their code. Okay, but what if you want to do something more advanced? Let's have a look at that. 
say, what if you want to do uh, completely change your behavior system RD? Let's say you want to uh, encrypt stuff. In that case, this is probably not what you want to do, but you want to create your own RDD. And in my next sample, I will show you how you can create an RDD that inherits from one of our RDDs, but of course you can do your own one completely from scratch as well. Um, if you do a completely new one, you decide whether you either you inherit from work area or you start just from object and then implement everything from IRDD. My example at this moment will show you how to uh, enhance DPF, NTX, and add encryption. And it's not the best encryption in the world. I would call the poor man's encryption, but you get the idea. Okay, let's look at the code. This is the um, RED class. And what I have created is a class that inherits from DPF NTX. Now, what I wanted to do is implement encryption, poor man's encryption. And uh, to do that, of course, you need to know how the DPF NTX works. And well, the good thing for me was that I know how it works. And as you can see, we're only updating two methods here and a property. So let's see, look at the normal RDD class first, which is in the runtime. Close these methods. Now you can, all this code, there's no secret here. You can also get this code from GitHub if you want. But what I, of course, I had the advantage that I know what was happening. And let's go into a uh, go top method. This is a normal go top method. You don't see any uh, data access here, so this is not going to help you. So where do we start? Let's see what a get value does when you read a field. Okay, here we get some more information. You see that it reads a record. Now, this is the place where we probably want to do something. And as you can see here, read record, checks if the buffer is valid. It means that it probably has read the record already and when it is valid or it's an of file, it returns true. And then if the file is open, it's going to do some calculations, a seek and an F read. And it reads, the current record in the current record buffer, underscore record buffer. Now, if you want to do encryption, um, this is the place where you actually want to do something. After it's read the buffer, um, assuming that the buffer is encrypted, we may want to decrypt the buffer. And as you can imagine, there's not just a read record, but there's also a write record. Um, you see similar behavior, it checks whether it's open. If it's read only, it throw an exception. If it's not read only, it calculates the position and does an F write. I'm going to skip all the other details, but this gives you the idea. So, what you want to do is if you want to um, do encryption, you have to make sure that this record buffer is encrypted before this write record is called. Now, this is a virtual protected method, so we can subclass it, and that is what I've done in my sample. In my sample here, I've said, okay. I'm going to have a virtual protected write record, which is then called before the uh, method in the parent class is called. And then I'm going to uh, increase every number in the buffer with one. So a record buffer for DPS consists of bytes. And I'm just uh, adding one to every byte and prevent overflow when the bytes 255 are changes to zero. And it is it only does this when it's hot because when it's not hot, which is a flag in the in the runtime, it means that there's nothing to be there's no need to be, to write anything. So that makes things a bit faster. And read record does the opposite. It's, it says okay when it's encrypted, and I'll show you why 
when it, how it detects that, but when it's encrypted, it actually goes, it's going to get the, all the bytes in the buffer and subtract one. And of course, when it's zero, it has to uh, overflow to 255. Now the property encrypted is new, is created in this subclass, and it says, look at the first byte in the record buffer. When it's a space or an asterisk, 32 or 42, then it's normal. Uh, the, the, the asterisk indicates that the uh, record is deleted. So when it's not 32 and not 42, we assume it's encrypted. And then we're going to do the encryption routine. And as you can see here, after uh, decrypting the buffer, we also have to decrypt the deleted flag because uh, the super read record sets the deleted flag based on 32 and 42. But since it was encrypted, we have to do it ourselves here. A lot of words, but it's just how this works. Now, we need to tell the X sharp runtime that we have an RDD. To do that, we call a method in the registered RDD class, which is part of the runtime. And we give it a registered RDD object, <coughs> excuse me, with my DBF MTX, the name and the type. And I'm setting the default RDD to my DBF MTX. And now we have a test program. And what it's doing is going to register the RDD, it's the code to solve, going to do a go top and then skip through field, through every field or every row, and then do a field put on the first one. And this field put is actually going to force it to decrypt, but of course, when we start, it's not encrypted. And then uh, after the field put, the buffer gets hold and it's going to encrypt. I have, I have a file here. This is uh, the normal customer DBF. And I've added some code in the uh, example here that says, copy this file to the output folder. So we start always with a clean file. And let's run this. And when we see the message encrypting done, we're going to open the uh, File. So let's go to the folder of the output. And as you can see now, the RDD is encrypted. It's not the best encryption in the world. Um, Todd has become UPEE. -E. As you can see, every character has added one. And the space has become an exclamation mark. But of course, you can invent your own much better encryption if you want. Now, after closing the file, we let the code run. Now the code, um, let's look at the code. It's actually going to open it again and then show us just the last name and first name. And of course this works. So the fields are decrypted on the fly and this just works. Let's see a similar one. So I have the similar DBF, but now it says copy of newer in the properties window. And since uh, this uses the same output folder and we just updated the file, uh, it, it will not copy. And I'm using the same uh, custom RDD and I'm registering it, but now in a MDI browse application. And it will be no surprise that, um, let's just check the file to be sure that it's still encrypted. Yes, it's still encrypted, but when I open it now, we're actually decrypting it on the fly. And now we can check this. Chris Evans, the browse works. And since we're manipulating a array of bytes, it's actually very fast. And as you can see now, Todd has been replaced with Chris. I know the font is too small for you, but it says, D I S E A T. Well, and that is C H R I S. And then we shifted one character. So the encryption decryption works. And as you can see, creating a custom RDD has, ne has never been easier than with the way we've implemented in uh, X Sharp. Um, I had some questions from last week that I also want to briefly answer. Okay, yes, RDDs are 
replaceable database drivers. Um, you can mix DB, VODB, and use commands. It's all, in the end, it's all going to go to uh, the core DB class where the actual work is done. One question that I got was, okay, uh, one of you guys wants to work not with the VODB server. What do you recommend? Well, actually, it depends, but if you want, and I know this particular guy wants to write his own strongly typed RDD class, it's either you use uh, the VODB functions or you code against uh, VODB slash CoreDB. And if you want to be real brave, of course, you can also directly code against the work area, so the RDD objects. I would still recommend to um, use VODB use area or something similar to open the area, but after that, using the um, uh, method that I've shown in the wrapper class here, using this trick, you can get the object and then work directly against the object. And um, the, the only, I, I want, but I have to correct myself. Um, there is a, uh, if you do that, you're working directly at, a, at an area. And I, what I, one of the things I want about is be careful because the macro compiler compiles and assumes that if you have an index on last name, that it's, uh, there's a field in the current area with the name last name. Now, if the current area is not set properly, um, since could go wrong, but I have to correct myself because um, let's just have a look at the code and then I'll explain why. In the uh, RDT system, like I said, we have a base class called work area and all macros in the RDT system, so those are the macros for code blocks for uh, indexes, but also for filter and for for block and while blocks are compiled using a compile function, which is in the work area class, and they are evaluated using eval block, which is also in the work area class. Now, when I when I last uh, replied to the question, how do we do this? How do we take care of the current work area switch? I said you have to do it yourself. But when I reviewed this over this weekend. I actually had already given some thought when we designed this that we have to enforce the code block evaluation to be in the current work area, in the right work area. So this actually takes care of switching work areas. So when the current work area number is not the area of the IDD where this code block is evaluated, then it's actually going to switch the area, evaluate the block, and, and then finally it's going to restore the area. Where the area is already correct, it just evaluates the blocks. So uh, I have to correct myself. There is no problem at all. The uh, code blocks for um, index expressions are evaluated in the right area. So um, you can do everything directly on the object if you want. I hope that answers the question. Uh, so you do not have to worry about making sure the correct area is set when the RDD goes cold. Um, there's one other thing that I, in this particular context, let's go back to the, uh, i show you the code for DBF CDX. When we create indexes, uh, we actually, as you can see, use the RDD compile to compile the key expression. And then we call eval block that we saw before, which takes care of selecting the right work area. When we actually go into, um, what, I, what you don't see here is that sometimes we do not use the macro compiler to uh, get key expressions. Because uh, what we try to do is to detect 
if a key expression is just a single field. Like, let's say you have a key expression of customer number and that's a field. Then we do not use the macro compiler to evaluate the key expression. But if we detect that it's a single field, uh, whatever collecting the uh, key value, we directly get it out of the buffer. But that's also not a problem. Uh, we don't have to worry about work area numbers there because uh, the buffer is in the object and this gets called on the object. So that's al already correct. So what we do is when it's a single field index, we bypass the, the uh, macro compiler just for speed and directly get the value out of the buffer. Now, um, on another moment, I would gladly explain what all these get date field and get num field value do, but these are delegates that uh, handle specific um, uh, operations necessary to, get, to either get a numeric field value expression for the index or uh, get a value with a collation or stuff like that. So, <clears throat> in short, you do not have to worry. Uh, even either the code blocks get evaluated through eval block when it's a complicated code block or when it contains a function like an upper or a string or something. When it's a single field code block, there's also no problem because then uh, we directly read the uh, value of the current field from the buffer. And in that case, uh, work areas play no role at all. It just gets it out of the object for the uh, current area. Okay. Um, there was also a question about buffered servers from, uh, I think it was from Carl. Um, to be honest, I don't really know what the buffered server class does, but yes, uh, work area changes are buffered. Uh, we have a byte array that you could see in the read value and write value. And this byte array actually, um, when you when you go cold in the RDD, so when the, the, the RDD detects that something has been updated and has to be written, then uh, this byte array gets sent to this. So you could uh, roll back the changes to this byte array. And there's actually a runtime function already called VODB buff refresh, which exactly does that. So uh, I'm not sure what the buffered server does. So, but anyway, this uh, uh, VODB buff refresh actually refreshes the current record buffer byte array and read back the values from this. Um, are there any other degrees? Uh, questions, I mean? You can switch your audio on if you want. Uh, no? Let's go back to if I have anything else here. Oh, yeah. Look at our GitHub repo. There's a link on the front page of our website as well with the Git icon under the top right corner. This is where the source is. Uh, if you want to play with this, I recommend downloading the source. You can either download it as a zip file or you can uh, clone our repo and then you get a local version of the repo and just play with that. Um, if you uh, do not want to recompile everything, but you still want to debug what we're doing. I recommend installing it into uh, the location uh, that we use, which is, uh, I'll show you the location. X sharp, dev RT, that's where our uh, runtime assemblies are, are compiled. And if you get the source code from, from uh, X sharp public and put it in the same folder structure, and then use the uh, uh, DLL files and PTB files from the debug folder. You can actually debug and have the files uh, and the, the locations of the files in the PDB to match whatever we had on our development machine. So that's also a way to debug what's happening in the RDB system. Okay, are there any other questions? No? You're also quiet today. Where is my audio just broken no, no, i think it's well it's uh, five people and uh, most of us were already in the previous session so I think yeah yeah i know covered. i know that's why there's no question